Richtig. Welcome to the Startup Voyage, and in this episode, we take a critical look at the less discussed aspects of Web3. Uh, in this episode, I've labeled it Web3, The Unveiled, the ugly truth behind the tech, this tech revolution. Now, we'll explore some key topics that shed light on some of the challenges, the controversies, and the complexities that are uh, now existing in Web3. And today, we have our guest, Andrew Kay brings his extensive experience in the industry to provide a nuanced understanding of these issues. Um, he is the founder of Web3 Research, an innovative company that's making Web3 more accessible to everyone. And his journey in the crypto world is nothing short of remarkable. Uh, with a background that intertwines technology and business, Andrew has been at the forefront of the Web3 for over a decade. He's not only been one of the youngest managers at Berkshire and Hathaway, uh, their R&D division, but he's also led his own DeFi projects and run a successful Web3 marketing agency, which I have lots of questions around that, your experience around that. But uh, what's truly exciting is his current venture, Web3 Research, a beacon in the Hong Kong Science Park, currently developing a crypto, crypto influencer report, which is a tool that promises to guide uh, crypto enthusiasts in navigating the complex waters of market trends, uh, avoiding scams, and enhancing the research. Uh, Andrew is here to offer his unique perspective on the crypto space, drawing from his extensive knowledge uh, and experiences from his gritty technical aspects of Web3 to the broader social and ethical implications of crypto. Uh, he's ready to tackle it all on this show, but that's not all. Andrew will share his personal journey in the Web3 world, um, his own challenges and failures, and the successes that have shaped his path. He's not just an expert, he's an enthusiast who shares our values of honesty, integrity, and innovation in Web3. So uh, Andrew, I'd like to welcome you to the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you uh, here with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, I think one of the things you, you uh, you, you you neglected to mention about my uh, about my history is I've also been, lost a lot of money and, <laughs> and time, uh, you know, navigating this Web3 space um, as well. And I think that's also important as one of the reasons why we're having the conversation today. But thanks so much for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I think it's one of those things. I mean, um, for sure, it's one of the things I was going to get to. Uh, people <laughs> right now in the space are probably pretty happy uh, uh, making some money with a lot of these altcoins and Solano blockchain doing really well and a lot of um, more, I guess, more speculation that's happening, <laughs> what's going to happen yeah. next year. But the funny thing I always have to say is like, uh, no one ever talks about when they lose money, right? So when you, mm -hmm. you're on the chat, people are saying, hey, look at my, look at my uh, portfolio and they're showing the charts and seeing how everything jumps. Given this assumption that I just like whatever, like, you know, uh, just loaded up, you know, on, on some, some coin, but no one talks about when things are lost. Uh, but we'll get into that. But I think um, where I want to kick off as a, as a, a core topic, and I think it's important going in uh, to 2024 in, in the past, look, ever since the crypto winter, we all know that every, one has been purely focused on building, building something real, mm -hmm. sustainable. Um, you know, the idea of raising through token sales. Yes, it's still happening, but it's not as popular. People are actually really building stuff. But um, with that said, I think still what um, Web3 and blockchains, uh, it's still early days. And one of the challenges has been interoperability. And uh, it's, you know, we think Web3 is supposed to be the seamless integration, but we know, you know, from history that it takes a while for diverse platforms to work together to really um, benefit from a fully functional decentralized internet. Um, and it's going to be a challenge and everyone's fighting for to be the L1 that will, you know, kind of take over everyone else. There's a lot of L2s coming back 
uh, on board. And I think the uh, the real world example is just basically the difficulty in achieving cross chain compatibility among different uh, blockchain platforms, uh, with each blockchain operating you know, its own set of rules and protocols. So it makes it pretty hard. So I'd like to kind of start there. You know, in your experience, I'd like you to you know kind of share what you do at Web three Research and how you've approached this chaotic space in in, in building in Web three. Yeah, it, it it right now. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I think right now. Um, it's the wild west and yeah. everybody's making anything and you, yeah. you know, it's, um, it's not even the technical aspects of it, but just looking at it, you know, we're talking about the next generation of adoption. What is an L1? What is an L2? I, mm. you know, I even work with a company that claims they're a, a, a layer 0. 0.5. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's, a, there's a lot of this infrastructure level, um, compatibility issues, consensus mechanisms and dealing with bridges and every single bridge, at least to my knowledge, has been hacked in some way or another right, because right. you have to deal with this thing that essentially gets pulled off chain or there's some centralization thing. Um, and, and these are, you know, points of attack and they're not, um, they're not really Web3. There's a lot of Web3 that's, that's, that's not Web3. There's a couple of ways that it can get solved. Like I know Polkadot's trying to do some things. Cosmos is trying to do this. So there's this layer of protocol um, oriented uh, solution uh, that that's trying to get solved. Uh, I work with a company called Ort. Um, they used to, they got rebranded from CCN. Um, mm. uh, it's a it's a Stanford professor actually um, who came up with it, and and that's an another infrastructure layer. They're the zero point five solution. Um, there's also uh, you know you could do it. I guess not to use layer. You could do it a sort of a a stratosphere up and at a wallet level if you're talking about interoperability of, of, you know, if my Ethereum chain link and my Solana chain link, you know, how, how that works, you could do it at the, at the wallet level. I think the most important thing here though, isn't necessarily the tech that's for the builders to figure it out, but the, the end user, they don't care. Sure. <laughs> they don't care what chain it's on. Right. They just want it to work. And so I think the real problem to solve is, um, how can you create this frictionless experience? Because if I have to, um, if I have to worry about going through these other, if if I'm trying to go over to Polygon from Ethereum and I have to go through these extra steps, or I have to switch wallets, or I have to deal with these bridges that have you know uh, inherent security issues, um, you're starting to turn off a large population of people who are trying to use this technology. So I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of security vulnerability issues. There's fundamental infrastructure issues that need to be resolved. But I think fundamentally what builders need to be focusing on is, hey, the end user is not really going to care what chain that they're, this, this thing is on, right? They're right. not purists like the rest of us. Right. A lot of builders come into this space with this mentality like I'm EVM only or I'm Bitcoin purist or I'm whatever it is. Um, but a lot of people, they don't under, they're not, they cannot be expected to understand what these things are. So, sure. you know, they're going to go towards like a centralized exchange because that kind of puts all these things into one little basket in the centralized exchange. I'm not advocating necessarily for centralized exchanges, but sure. what they're what they're doing is essentially solving some of these issues by having this by dealing with all the things in the background. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I think that makes sense uh, if you even think about. Well, first of all, a lot of trust has been broken in this space. Um, through a lot of the scams and hacks. Yeah, there's a lot of peers still in the space. Even for myself, I remember the first time thinking about um, receiving actually some monies uh, into my, my MetaMask wallet and then deciding, okay, which chain should I use because I want to save money, right? So then you kind of have to figure it out, right? You know, what's going to be cheaper? Mm -hmm. So I moved over to uh, BSC uh, because, it, you know, it, it was fast and it was cheap, right? Um, and yeah, you're right to that point that, the users don't want to think about that, but on the on the other side of things, uh, you look you hear about the um, the issues with Ledger and what they're having right now. Uh, that that in itself is sort of like you know Ledger is a huge re re reputable name in the industry when it comes to cold wallet storage, and you hear about <laughs> these uh, these um, these uh, hacks that happen. And you know, how how do you address that? I mean, at the end of the day, like that's what you're saying. It's uh, 
you, you got to build a user experience that's um, very simple and almost as if mimics what the people are used to today. Like people yep. don't want to see anything that's different, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that was one of the mistakes I made early on. So there's a there's a branding and language component to this as well. Yeah. Um, because so I I kept all my Bitcoin on Mt. Gox yeah. back in the day. Um, yeah. Because I, I was like, this is just like Bank of America. <laughs> this yeah. is just yeah. like yeah. city. Yeah. And I keep it here. And this is a central authority that's going to take care of it for me. Obviously, I was very wrong. Um, you know, this is one of many times where I, I didn't understand, um, you know, I, I didn't understand custody or some of these fundamental mechanisms that are right. important in the Web3 space. And, I you know, I, I, I took a haircut on that. Um, so I think that there's a, another component to this as well, which is you you as an end user, how much risk are you willing to take on board? Like, yeah. you know, there's a spectrum of people who are like, I'll keep everything on a central exchange because it's easy. I'm lazy. And, you know, I trust CZ. And yeah. the other side is like, well, no, not your keys, not your coins. Right. And so I feel like there's, there's, there's a comfort level that you need to be aware of because it's not, a, I don't think it's a one size fits all uh, solution um, right. at the end as well, because yeah, everybody could have a ledger, cold wallet. There's a lot of friction there, tapping all the little <laughs> buttons and then plugging it in and then the USB doesn't work. And, right. um, you know, so it's like, how, how much friction are you willing to deal with? How much risk are you willing to take on? Mm. Um, because if I have my entire bank account just car carrying around in my pocket, it's a little, you know, uh, it's a yeah. little sketchy for, for me. So maybe there yeah. is a centralized component to this. That uh, that people need to 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 ease their way into or on ramp into as well. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it, look, you got two sides of everything, and I think the majority of the population is still used to very used to um, banking the way it is today, and they're not shouting like, "Oh, you can't trust banks," right? They're not shouting that, right? Um, but do do you still see? I mean, with with that level of risk, that's the one thing I could never understand. Um, okay, if you had maybe 5,000 USD or USDC of, 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 uh, on your, your, on your person, right? Uh, you might feel okay about it. But when you start getting mm -hmm. more and more, I mean, 10,000, 20,000, 25,000, it's no different than in a way, um, maybe not exactly, but if I'm stashing stacks of cash, paper, paper currency in my house or in a safe it kind of feels like the same thing uh except that it's a little bit more um worrisome because you got yeah. this little device right that maybe one day there will be a uh some you know some you know some hiccup on that little device maybe it doesn't work maybe it doesn't read i don't know <laughs> so i think yeah. it's a uh, kind of crazy uh kind of thinking about that yeah and well, another component to this, which isn't as frequent, but does happen, I, I know people that this has happened to is is IRL events. Yeah. Where there's people that have been kidnapped. Yes. Yes. Or you know, a lot of yes. a lot of crypto influencers and and and, and people go around. They're flashing. They're on their Twitter. It's just like oh, it's like twenty thousand. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like percent return on invested capital, um, and that leaves you open to you know potentially. Uh, you know, a physically threatening yeah. situation. Um, and that's not something that we, we, you know, we want to really be a part of. So it is, uh, it is difficult to navigate. And then, you know, what if you forget your seed phrase or you lose the thing or, right. you know, there's, there's a lot of these layers to it that, um, that I think a, a, a lot of people, at least my estimation is that this next generation of adopt of, 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 uh, of web three adoption mm. um, will be people who are a little bit more comfortable, at least at, at the beginning with a slightly more centralized solution. And right. I'm, I'm okay with that. I trust centralized solutions all the time. Everybody's like, Oh, I'm web three native. I'm like, well, what's your website hosted on? Right, oh, AWS. Right. Well, <laughs> I mean, come yeah. on, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's only a small fraction of what you're doing that is actually truly yeah. web three. So I think there can be, um, these sort of uh, inter uh, intermediary solutions. And I, I, I do know that there are some um, interesting, you know, multi-factor authentication uh, deals that are going on. There's a right. lot of clever people out there who are working to solve these these problems. So it, it is an accessible problem. It's yeah. just challenging to overcome. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think one of my experiences of multi-factor uh, authentication was, uh, you know, to move any sort of money, I didn't care how much it was, I, I would go through the same process, right? So you've got your face, then you've got SMS, and then you've got email, and then you've got, you know, a password, right? You've got all these things you can add as many as you want you know, on the, some platforms. Um, <laughs> but then it's so cum cumbersome, I just couldn't... Um, I just wish it was a lot easier, to be honest, to to move in and out, right? Um, but it was it was interesting to kind of uh, go through that experience. But um, you know, you said you've run a Web three marketing agency. Uh, I, I don't. Do you still do that now? Is that one? Of well, so I uh, ran operations at a digital marketing agency, okay. and we serviced right. more traditional clients. Right. Um, my brother runs a, a Web three marketing agency. Okay. Um, okay. And so I've had a. I've had a lot of exposure and, you know, we also uh, did the majority of uh, marketing for some of the Web3 projects that I've, I've worked on as well. So not exactly run my own oh, right, right, uh, Web3 right. marketing agency, but I have a lot of experience in traditional got it, got uh, marketing it. agencies and, and my brother's obviously pretty heavily involved in the space as well. Right, right. Okay. So then I guess when it comes to that, uh, I guess, what is your perception of what is a Web3 marketing agency then? What does it mean? Or to be a Web3 company, you know uh, I mean? I, I, I say I'm a Web3 podcaster. I talk about Web3 technologies and founders, but when you're looking at marketing, what does that really mean? Right? Uh, to you. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to be a little harsh here yeah. because it's, um, it's an unregulated space. Mm. And this is one of the tr tr problems where we're trying to solve, you know, uh, with the, the influencer report, which is, you know, part of more like an AI Web3 uh, solution is there's almost a paint by numbers, at least in this last in this last cycle and the cycle before that, when they're figuring it out in 2017, the ICO boom, it's, um, oh, hey, we're doing a token because token is a very easy um, uh, fundraising mechanism and, right. you know, it's fairly unregulated. So, you know, you incorporate a Panama company or a BVI company and you sort of, you know, you sort of offshore liability. And so it doesn't come back onto you. And then as a marketer, your, your job is, Hey, this project, it doesn't have something that's live yet. Um, but you can buy the token, which for whatever reason, the token's available <laughs> on the on the on the Web three stock market, and then you can speculate on that, even though the token doesn't really serve a value. I mean, the purpose of the token is it has to have a utility, otherwise it's a security. And so yeah. everybody tries to justify utility through these various mech uh, through these various like, oh, it does this or that. Um, and Web three marketers, a lot of them, not all of them, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of them, they exist out there to essentially uh, pump the token price. Yeah. Uh, and it, you, you know what I mean? And, and it's, it's, and it's, it's not necessarily legal. So I, I think that, um, it's a difficult line to walk, especially with regulation going in, the, in what I feel is a positive direction. I think that there does need to be some regulation in the, in the industry because people are like lo losing their houses over this. Um, I feel like a lot of web three marketers, again, not all of them, they, they they go out, they'll do, it's a paint by numbers, community management, we'll plug you into some other VCs, we'll, we'll run airdrop competitions for you, we'll put out uh, articles, we'll, we'll, we'll do these things. And it's not necessarily the marketer's fault, like the, the marketers are getting hired on to, to, to help this company generate awareness and a byproduct or focus of that awareness is to get people to buy the token. People buy the token, it raises the price of the token. So mm -hmm. other people can sell the token and it's like playing hot potato. So I think that it, this next bull market, this next cycle that we run into, um, that we're running into, uh, will hopefully produce uh, a different kind of marketer that isn't, or, or influencer, I guess as well, because influencers are, you know, all of a sudden they have marketing studios as well. Um, we, we literally paid $2,000 for a tweet one time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, like, it was like one ETH when 2000, when ETH was at 2000, like the last cycle or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, why are we doing this? 
but based off of the engagement and response that we got, it was kind of worth it. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, th I do think that this next generation of marketers and the marketing environment will hopefully be improved <laughs> because as you touched on earlier, there's less of these token oriented projects, it's more tech oriented projects. Mm. Um, but that is still a concern that I, I think we're gonna need to deal with collectively because the, the losers are not the VCs or the companies, the losers are the, the new people who are trying to get into the space. Right. And those are the ones we want to keep in there. Right. Um, and it only takes one bad, you know, Warren Buffett says, you know, you spend a lifetime building a reputation, it only takes one incident to, to ruin the entire thing. And I think that's what's, what some of these bad situations have done to a lot of people. It's just totally turned them off to Web3 technology. Right, right. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if we if we look at the what you just mentioned as Web3 marketing, I guess to me that's what people are considering is native, right? Because their intent, even though they don't say it, say it right away, um, when people come to me, essentially they want you to shill their project because they're going to have a TGE and they want to <laughs> basically get some money out of it. Now, understanding that it's not regulated and um liquidity is expensive and it's not a lot out there for for a new project and if they can't get traditional vc money then they try to do a token raise because it's much easier right get it yeah. for the masses um if you can still do that now through some listing on some exchange like you know what binance had that ball uh, it's insane right it, and i just kind of feel like it's the um it's maybe the the, the last uh, cycle uh, that this will happen because regulators around the world in different jurisdictions are still putting things in place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I totally agree. I mean, there, and that's not to say that there aren't token projects that don't have true utility, right? But I would say it's. I, I, this is just a guesstimation. I'm just some guy, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like 95% don't actually have the, the true utility that's required to, to you know, be like, hey, yeah, you should have a token because we're going to use these tokens um, for a very specific utility instead of you're using the tokens to, to, to raise capital against. Um, so, I mean, it. Uh, this is hopefully i i think uh the last cycle that will will have to deal with this sort of craze because you know i see i saw that bong token i know people that have made like a lot of money off <laughs> not a lot of money um yeah. and i'm like man it'd be cool if i had a couple <laughs> of steam coins right now yeah. uh you know I, so I, I i get it and and it, it it almost markets itself when you start yeah. seeing returns like that sure because people look into that and this 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 sort of greedy you know human nature that i i, I admit i i saw that bong token i was like oh wow i should have <laughs> sure. listened to some of my friends who are like you should buy this uh you know I, you, you can't help um some of this th these natural inclinations yeah um i i think as this industry matures because it's like, you know, it was a baby and we're like, oh, Bitcoin, you know, whatever. Like, and then you have the the Dogecoin, which was on like the R, R was like a spinoff from uh, the subreddit because they were bored at the price action of Bitcoin. Yeah. And now that's like a legitimate thing. You know, you see all these things and then the ICO craze. And, um, you know, I think we, we are, we think it, like ahead. So I remember 2017, everyone's like, Oh, smart contracts. Mm. This can do so many things. Yeah. But then no one was really writing any smart contracts. They were just like, here's a token and here's the <laughs> idea of the smart contract. And that's what that bus was. And then you started seeing some things in DeFi summer. And so mm. we're, you know, I think we're always going to be thinking a little bit ahead. We're always going to be like a little optimistic about the technology. Yeah. Um, and that's going to drive some of the speculation. But I, I do imagine that this will probably be one of the last times that we're going to be hmm. dealing with some of this uh, overhype around around things. Right. Well, let, let's look at, uh, well, I mean, NFTs, right? Let's look at the, the dark side of NFTs. Now, you know, these uh, non-fungible tokens, they created a lot of buzz, you know, at one time before DeFi summer, I believe. Um, and, but they've been plagued with scams. Even the uh, Board 8 Yacht Club guys, you know, some of their tokens were, were uh, taken hostage, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> but they were returned. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of intellectual property issues of whether a digital format of something that's physical, does it really 
you know, tie them together and there's a lot of market volatility. Where, where do you think NFTs will, will, will go? Because there's still a lot of arguments on, oh, but, you know, it has, if you have true utility, it can really happen. Yeah. Um, so I am not a huge fan of the way NFT technology has been branded and distributed because mm. a lot of the criticisms I feel like hold a lot of water. Like, mm. oh, hey, it's a, just a, a like a, a digital thing. I think there's some exceptions. I think uh, people uh, who I've been following for a long time, I, I also make 3D art for fun. Uh, and he's just this guy who's just every single day I'm going to put something out every single he's so um, <laughs> uh, methodical he's got he, he perseveres through all this stuff I think there are some people like that that there is this the idea of the value is going to stay there but yeah. the majority of them uh, are not because people are over hyping the, the profile pick but they're not understanding the underlying the value of the underlying technology right the value of the underlying technology is 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 tremendous but it's not in this speculative sort of way if you're talking yeah. about art it's provenance um self-sovereign identity concert tickets like there's a lot of these things and you know it can tie the self-sovereign identity thing it can tie into being like an accessory so there's a uh uh there's a, a project that i that i that i worked on that that I didn't actually end up taking off because COVID hit and all this stuff but mm. it was using uh you know uh items on your phone in a in a real space it was like the, my, my buddy was a he, he ran a bunch of nightclubs and it was a promoter for a lot of uh, electronic artists in, in new england and he had this idea for this space that uh was covered in like led lights and um you know it's connected to your phone and depending on your ticket the led lights around you would light up a certain color that sort of thing right and if you think about the value of fashion like an hermes belt costs around 600 dollars. it's not worth that at cost, mm -hmm. right? But people wear it because it's a status thing. So I do think that there's a lot of value that NFT can bring to your own identity. And I don't think there's necessarily a ceiling there. So I think that there is mm -hmm. a lot of potential value in NFTs. I think they need to be rebranded. Right. Because if you hear mm -hmm. NFTs, you, you know, you get clearly two reactions. There's no yeah. like neutral, like, oh, I don't think that, you know, you're like, I love NFTs or it's just like, it's a scam, right? Yeah. Um, so I think if we could rebrand that acronym into something else um, and if people are using it and not knowing that it's an NFT, I think, you know, if you, it's a concert, it's a, uh, a, a digital concert ticket that gets to my Apple wallet when I'm going somewhere. Um, so you're not dealing with scams or, or whatever it is. Like, I know that's kind of like a rudimentary example, right. but, um, and I don't know it's an NFT. I think that there's a lot more value in that than being like, here's my picture of a, of a, of an ape, uh, or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and then you have a lot of people that do like wash trading and things like that too. And then right. who, who ends up footing the bill? It's retail. It's all these new people. It's a similar sort of story to tokens. So, yeah. Yeah. So wh how much, um, wash trading or nefarious activity do you think happened in an nft space how much of, how much of it was real or was like half <laughs> half the trades being pushed left and right for other purposes i so you can look at on chain data and i um i didn't i didn't get too deep into watching and on-chain nft data because i never really speculated on nfts mm. um i i bought a couple because they were my friends uh like projects or i got them for free i i actually at, at eve denver a couple years ago if you got the buffy corn nft um you were able to get into a bunch of private events and vitalik was at one of them i got this free mm. like like cat shirt that's shooting the <laughs> ethereum out of it like I, I was like i got my money's worth out of this <laughs> nft um but uh, I do know that there are quite a few of these where it was a combination of things like, hey, we got this third party, this market maker or market maker. There's a lot, yeah. you know, you, that's a pretty loosely thrown around term. <laughs> <laughs> Left to the market maker right. uh, that would go and, and do wash trading. And, you know, for those of you who don't know what wash trading is, you just buy a bunch of them yourself to raise up the artificially raise up the, the, the value of them. And especially if you have a smaller collection and you don't really care or you're assuming people are looking at on-chain uh, data, you can start to really write, uh, raise that value. And so it's a lot of fake trades 
and then you get start getting some people involved. You get a marketer involved. Like, look at the floor price of this. Um, floor price is the, the 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 absolute bottom price for the cheapest NFT. Look at the mm. floor price. It's raised by an entire Ethereum uh, in in the last like two weeks. It's really really hot. And I see this again and again and again. And then retail starts buying it, and they hit a certain threshold because um, all they're doing is they're paying gas fees, right? Mm. And they're they're paying themselves. So the wash trading, they're not really losing a tremendous amount of value, and especially on a on a network like Solana, where you know um, uh, transaction fees are really low. Uh, and then retail starts investing, and then retail hypes it up, and then someone at some point is just like, well. I've made my money. I'm going to cash out. And then you see, you know, you see this thing again, you see these little, like the patterns again and again and again, yeah. the big red, red bars down. Um, so in terms of percentage, I, I couldn't tell you an exact number, but it, it was significant. It wasn't like, Oh, one or two bad apples. Yeah. It was yeah. significant. Well, that was the one thing that always um, was, uh, you know, if you think about it, a lot of the stuff can be seen, the activity that can be seen if it's all in chain. Um, some people are looking at it, uh, I guess, because you don't know exactly who owns those wallets. You can't really call them out, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, all, unless you uh, have some indication of, you know, um, the, the wallet and the, the sus suspecting who the owners are, right? Um, you know, I actually had a brief, uh, introduction to a company called Tres Finance or Tres, Tres Finance. And mm -hmm. they were telling me about their platform in which they just need access to your um, public wallet and APIs into all these different read only data that you feed into their system. So they can be uh, information that comes from a traditional bank account, uh, money's going inflows and outflows. Uh, it could be uh, from your environment for your wallet right? Inflows and outflows. And what it's essentially trying to do is give you a holistic view of mm -hmm. your actual um, financial health of, of all of your accounting of everything, like whether it be CFI, DeFi, TradFi, uh, it doesn't really matter. It tries to capture everything. And I think it's pretty amazing because in many cases, like you think about some of the, uh, these DeFi projects, uh, I always wonder their TVL when they say, oh yeah, we've got you know, fifty million dollars, and then if you really look at it, if anyone was really smart, they say, okay, well, it looked like you know millions of dollars were just pushed in, right? And you can say, oh, it was a a market maker, or it was maybe a a fund right. manager, or something like that. You can create some story, like you know, they pulled in all these retail guys in, but in reality, it's just one guy scratching the other person's back to make it look like they're getting all this TVL. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, and, and that's like another thing with um, uh, with central exchanges, they require a certain amount of volume, yeah. a certain amount of liquidity. And that's why these market makers come in. There's even like automated tools that yeah. uh, that that people use, um, you know, and it does paint if you don't if you don't have the wherewithal or the time or the effort to go into all of the details, right. you can be like, Oh, this looks great. All of these, um, uh, all of these, this top level indicators of how healthy this project is mm. look fantastic. But if you get one level deep, you're like, Oh, okay. So this is all coming from these same two addresses and things like right. that. And I know that there are some um, fantastic on chain uh, uh, projects that are trying to address this. One of them is called Arkham. Yeah, uh, it's a really cool visualizer of what other wallets this thing is. This thing is uh, uh, touched and, and inflows and outflows. I think that's that's also a pretty pretty cool tool. Um, we're we're also working on one similar to the influencer report. We're all, we've also uh, worked on this uh, wallet trust factor, mm -hmm. which you know, just shows like uh, you know how how trustworthy is this wallet. Um, you know, originally we were thinking from the copy trading standpoint, but I'm thinking just from an inf information standpoint, like yeah, you input yeah. a wallet, how old is it, is it? How often are they, are they trading the news? Are they profitable? Is it just shuffling money in and out? Mm. Um, all of these things are, are, are really, um, important, uh, to understand, but we start running into a problem pretty quickly, which is the next hundred million users are not going to be native. They're not going to, they don't want to have the time or the effort, 
you know, to go in and do all this research, do all this due diligence. And it's just like, well, you should do your due diligence if you're going to put money into something. But, you know, there is this, uh, there is a, a large group of people who are very interested, who have day jobs, who, who want to involve themselves in the, in the ecosystem, and they're not going to. So it's like, if you present them one of these tools, it's just like, all right, set up a wallet. <laughs> oh, how do I do that? You know, you, you get to step one and it's already you're, you're losing a, a percentage of people who are coming on board. So um, I think the next gener like we have a lot of the tools, we have a lot of the infrastructure. It's just the next generation has to be this this um, this thing that sits on top of everything hmm. and 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 I guess adjusts to your your comfort level, your experience level. Um, and, and your risk level. There's a lot of these sort of variables that you need to take into play. Um, yeah. and so I think those are going to be some of the big winners this this next cycle. So, so Well, you mentioned this next cycle having more regulatory, uh, I guess, guardrails in place, and you think it's good. Um, but how do you think that will impact the industry in, in where it started, right? It's decentralized, no central authority. Uh, everyone's getting really excited about this Bitcoin ETF, but and institutions coming in, but institutions they love regulations, right? I they 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 need it to be regulated in order to operate, you know, pretty much their their, their whole um, business. So, what how's that going to impact sort of like the whole vision of I, this where yeah, it's going? That's, in? that's a really that's a really good point. I think um, when it's BlackRock. <laughs> when it's Larry Fink who's doing things, I'm I'm inherently like, no, I don't like it, um, and and I don't, I don't think a company with you know over nine trillion dollars in uh, under active management um, should. I don't think they care about people. Uh, it's it's a it's an entity that's done very well. Yeah. But I don't I don't think it really cares about people. So I'm I'm very hesitant um, when I hear things like that. But I think. Like regulation is not going to be able to stop a lot of the decentralized nature of things. And that's something that I really like. What I do want regulation to step in and do is, hey, you're a central exchange. Get the right licensing, you know, uh, KYC, uh, you know, do what you got to do on, on that on that side. So when there is uh, something like FTX or, or, or whatever, the, the right people are held accountable. I think also regulation from... Hey, your token project will get a license. You, you know mm. what I mean? Um, I, I don't. I, I, I think it's a, it's like an in between case. Like fully regulation means, oh, in order to have a MetaMask wallet, you got to KYC. In order to do any anything on chain, you got to let the government know. Um, I'm, I'm not, not for that. But what I am for is, how do we help people not bet their entire house? on an nft project that that go that you know it's a rug pull um mm. you know a few days later and and how do we how do we get um on the building side on the, on the people who are you know if you think about oh i'm a i'm a token project or i'm an nft project and i just started this 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 company i am essentially a central authority in theoretically even though the tokens are distributed um in a decentralized manner i created them Right. So right. if you are the sort of central point of authority, then there should be some accountability that's 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 put there, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that people are less inclined to do these rug pull things. And we're we're starting to see some justice. Right. Mm -hmm. Like after the Terra Luna, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, man, this this, this is awful. But, you know, he's, he got extradited to uh, to I think it's South Korea or the U.S. They both want him. But you have uh, SBF. You know, and it's crazy if, if SBF had just kept the Ponzi scheme up like a couple more months, like his Bitcoin portfolio would have like been able to cover those losses. Yeah. Um, but and you know, CZ starting to pay uh, pay these fines and will likely see some uh, some jail time um, for you know essentially laundering money for cartels and things like that. So I think these are good things. I, I don't like seeing people go to prison or whatever, but I, I mm. even worse than that, I, I, I hate to see people lose their house or lose right. a lot of money or lose their savings um, because they were, they were duped by good, uh, good branding and, and, and copy <laughs> into buying into something that ended up uh, not working out. Right. Right. You ever, you ever hear that um, one uh, analysis where they talked about um, looking at the largest 
players in the world such as BlackRock, right? And you've got Vanguard Group and State Street, all these guys, oh, yeah. the amount of money that they control and and they are essentially the largest shareholders in pretty much every major vertical, right? You can say uh, hospitality, you know, you can say uh, airlines, you can say who owns the oil, you can say their, their money is everywhere. So when they were saying, well, who actually controls uh, everything. It's not the president. It's not the government. No. <laughs> it's it's the CEO of BlackRock that decides what happens. Right? Uh, what, what, what's your thoughts on that? Do you believe that? Well, and they all own a piece of each other as well. Right, right. Um, and uh, that, to me, is very deeply concerning when they are seeing a future where everybody rents everything, nobody owns anything. Right. And they also own, you know, they, they also own lobby groups, they own media groups, they own the narrative that most people are paying attention to. Right. Um, they can, and I'm, I'm not saying they're evil. I'm not saying it's the death star, um, <laughs> but I'm saying that if, if they want something done, it's their decision and not yours. And to me, that yeah. is that is deeply concerning. And like I said, I don't I don't trust anything that comes out <laughs> of them or the things that they own. Um, which is why I think you know Web three technology is is needed because it gives more people a voice. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about like DAOs and and and, and how that could po possibly be a, a future of government or at least uh, replace some of the lack of of. Um, these tribal communities that we've gotten away from. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I am concerned about the sheer amount of wealth that these countries, or not these, not these countries, these organizations have, they own each other and they own more than most countries in the world combined. Um, and you see the income disparity across, across the globe is widening and widening as well. I think the top 1% owns as much as the bottom, like, 50 percent in the united states yeah and the united states like gdp is, is supposed to be it's supposed to be great yeah um so it's like okay there's a lot of these things that, that don't really uh add up I, I do see web3 as as being a potential solution i see the etf being beneficial and not beneficial beneficial because like oh what if they buy up everything like they're doing with with housing mm. um but they're also spreading awareness and they're making it more of like a, a normal household name as well so you know there's a double-edged sword there. Um, I definitely don't trust them. <laughs> they don't Do you, have my best interest in mind. If you so. don't trust, okay. So let me ask you: Have you followed that guy, Andrew Tate? Andrew Tate, yeah. <laughs> Do you believe in his whole moving towards a lifestyle to remove yourself from the matrix? The matrix being the government basically wanting the majority of the people to keep on working to take on more debt so they keep on working to produce the money that the government needs to run its wars and to do whatever it wants to do. So yes, yes and no. I mean, the military industrial complex does dictate a lot of, of how I think we, we perceive the world because they also own a lot of the media companies sure. and they're also owned by street state street, uh, uh, Vanguard and, and, and BlackRock. Um, Andrew Tate's dad was a CIA agent, though, as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, how much of this do I do I do I believe? How much of it is is misinformation? Um, I, I do find it really troubling that we continue. Like, here's something: everybody, every country in the world's in debt. To who? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right, <laughs> just right. like, just like cancel some of this stuff out, like, um, and and you know, I. I just, to oversimplify things, it's like well, we're borrowing against our children and our children's children, yeah. and so on and so forth. And it's just like, well, someone's got to foot the bill. It's like you right. maxed out a credit card, and instead of paying it off, you're like, hey, give me a uh, <laughs> give me a higher <laughs> limit here. Um, but I think uh, that's that's also pretty uh, pretty concerning. Um, yeah. So I, I agree and I disagree. You know, uh, there there is this sort of matrix. There is the um, the uh, the status quo that they you know I'm not the conspiratorial they want you to <laughs> adhere to, um, but uh, you know I'm I'm not I'm not sure if Andrew Tate's lifestyle of of women and cars and smoking cigars is really the way 
the way out of it. I don't disagree entirely with him, but it's right. also like, well, take it with a grain of salt. His dad was a CIA agent. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's just like you get a lot of these guys who, who try and throw, in my opinion, who try and throw like distraction in there. Alex right. Jones as well. Alex, Alex Jones, he was right about the frogs, but his yeah. dad was a CIA agent, <laughs> an intelligence officer as well, right? So, right. so you, uh, you know, so there's there's some truth in there, but there's also some distraction as well, I think. Right. So. Well, the reason why I bring that up, because I think one of the messages, uh, like like I follow Andrew Tate, and I think a lot of his core messages, they 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 have some meaning. I mean, they're, they're, there's mm-hmm. something behind it, right? And I believe that a lot of things that he does is purely for entertainment purposes and to mm-hmm. draw attraction and to, you know, have that voice, which you kind of need to do in, in this day and age. Um, but one of the things that he always talks about and, you know, not following the matrix, not following the herd is how I read it, but it is finding the, your, your financial independence, uh, which yeah. has been a huge message in the U S for many years, um, self-made mini- millionaires. And then you start looking at crypto and essentially there's all these kids, right. Or, you know, you can say influencers, crypto guys, whatever, all these guys are you now much younger, more millionaires are being made in the U.S. than ever before. Uh, and there's this drive to get into Web3 and crypto because they think, you know, this could turn their life around. And th- this is not only the U.S. This is in oh, yeah. under de- underdeveloped countries, you know, Africa, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, a lot of crypto activity coming out from those places because to them, if they invested like even a dollar, let's say the bond coin, and they came out ahead at twenty bucks, or whatever, right? Uh, that's that's amazing for them. This is like a, it's really kind of like a changes the not their life completely, but it changes their situation quite a bit. Now, whether or not they lose it, that's a different story. But like, do you think that will continue? Like Web three space encouraging, like I'm going to start up uh, this this coin. I'm going to be rich. I don't care about the project. I want to raise money so I can. Do whatever I want in life, right? I mean, do you think it'll continue like that? Couple of there's a couple of things here. I think that Web3 technology is here to stay. When I talk to TradFi people about it, they're like, oh, DeFi versus TradFi. I think they can both exist and they will both exist in the same space. For example, if HSBC uses Web3 technology to resolve a contract two days faster because of you know the logic <laughs> that's put in place and the security that exists there. You can multiply those two days over however many times a year that contract gets res- needs to get resolved, and you can see a quantifiable impact to the bottom line. Hmm. So I think that there's a ton of opportunity like that one, which isn't as sexy as the bond coin, that you can create this value. Um, I think also when you do take the risk on yourself, because right now when I go to the bank and I deposit money at, at City or Chase or whatever, they take that money and they lend it out to other hmm. people. And they make interest on that. And my money just sits there. And my interest is not keeping up with inflation, especially these days. It's not keeping up with inflation. So I feel like another slightly less sexy route that's going to serve people more than it is currently is if you go and you take your stable coins, they are very safe. You know, I'm using safe, you know, nothing, not financial advice, right? I'm not a financial advisor, but there are safer Mm -hmm. methods in which you can lend that out with low risk or lower risk and get higher returns than you are currently by having your money in the bank because you're taking on that risk and you know with uh with with some of these DeFi mechanisms you know you can you can make your money work harder for you i always say that you know DeFi users they don't care what money their Mm -hmm. what chain their money's on they just want their money to work harder for them and i think that's a fundamental like imperative that's 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 global that that transcends cultural bounds regardless of where you're at and especially um countries that are developing are really seeing mm-hmm. that um the, the advantage is there i know for a fact that there's going to be a lot of people who make a ton of money speculating and doing ta you know my brother does a lot of um day trading and stuff and you can get really deep into the charts and you know um <clears throat> i'm not saying that doesn't exist but i i think that there's some of these other areas that are slightly less sexy but have longer legs, mm. you know, because mm. if you're just trying to make money really quickly, well, there's a bull market potentially on the horizon. Good <laughs> luck, you know, take a thousand dollars and see what you can do with it. You know, yeah. like 2019, 2020, I did like seven X just doing mm. that, just speculating that like I've been right. on that side of things. Yeah. Um, 
And I've also been on the other side where I've lost like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars just in the wrong places or, you know, getting scammed or, or whatever have you. And it hurts. It hurts a lot. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there is this wonderful opportunity that's available to us that level, can level the playing field. I think that we need to be mindful of the kinds of playing fields that we are on and mindful of where we're getting the advice from and what mm. fundamentally we're trying to do. Like if you're trying to go and play the speculation game, it's like when I go to a casino, like, mm. you know, I like going to the slot, say the slot machines in Vegas and then you get free drinks and you can just watch the colorful screen. I never bet any more than I know I'm going to lose. I'm going to walk away from the casino with no money, but I'm going with my mm. friends, a couple free drinks. It's fine. Um, that's what I would treat that as. But if you really want to make long-term, you know, generational wealth, or you want to ch change, you know, uh, your situation fundamentally, I think there's some of these other less sexy avenues that you can um, really be successful at that aren't being uh, aren't being attacked right now because mm -hmm. everyone's like, oh, bong token, token, or this NFT thing over here. It made me a thousand X in three days. If you're willing to extend your your time horizon a little bit and be more sustainable, um, it, it'll you'll you'll get less headache, right? You won't mm -hmm. have to deal with the scammers. You won't have to deal with the hype, and long term, you'll be in a much better mental, physical, financial shape. Yeah. Well, I like I like that point, and I think that's uh, one of the, the key shifts that I see. I mean, for look, even in the tradfi market, there's still speculators. That's always going to be there, right? So that's a, a type of new investor that you're looking at, uh, which I think is very important to understand. What is the type of investor? If you go mainstream, who's going to come on board now? They're probably the ones, in my opinion, that will have a longer time horizon. Uh, and what that means is, <clears throat> if you look at uh, the world today. Uh, and let's say this, you know, we're both from the U.S. We look at the U.S. market. There's probably a ton of people who have not done enough um, uh, effort into saving money, right? But they always say you don't have to be that day trader, right? You don't have to go after the fast money. If you're willing to put your money in, let's say, what the, the S&P, right? It is proven time and time again after what after seven years or so, you'll probably double your money, right? It's kind of like some rule there, and it's it's been proven. Right. And even uh, if you just fight it through the bear market, leave your money, let it sit, it'll it'll go up. Um, and this is kind of in a way like, you know, if you're able to participate and you have your own assets and coins that you stake and it gives you a much higher percentage than what the S&P has been, what I think they're like around 10 percent. Right. Let's say you can get 15 percent, 20 percent. It just accelerates your time to your financial independence or like greater financial stability um, in, in the future. And I think that's the exciting part actually for me is, is you, you, I mean, you, you're taking them on the risk, therefore you should get more. If you don't mm -hmm. want to take on the risk, then go into, I don't know. I mean, they have bank account uh, deposits now that are earning what four and a half percent. So it's, it's changed a little bit because before I remember it was a time it was like, uh, a quarter percent, <laughs> you couldn't get yep. anything. Now they've, now you're getting something significant. But to your point, all they're doing is they're taking that money because they're putting it somewhere else and they're still making money off your your own money, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the, the most exciting part that I'm seeing, not so much the get rich, uh, you know, short-term yeah. horizon stuff, yeah. All right, so um, let's see. We talked about, let's see, what else can we cover? I did want to talk about maybe some of uh, the security vulnerabilities in general. So we talk, I mean, there's a lot of hacks. If you look in total volume, just still millions of dollars being hacked left and right from different projects, from different DeFi platforms. Um, and we all know that in order for things to go then mainstream, what on the security st uh, front, what needs to happen? Because it's not happening, happening like from the, like maybe some people are getting hijacked, you know, uh, in real life, you know, or whatever the case may be, or even online. Like I've heard these instances where some girl comes online, talks to the guy, try to act all friendly and, oh, can you teach me about crypto? And I, I think basically they scan the guy. into <laughs> to yep. him. All right. So there's all these stories. But yeah, for the large um, hacks that are happening, what, what needs to happen? What needs to change? Well, um, fortunately, that sort of thing is only going to get worse with AI and deepfakes. Um, right. That that this is uh, 
not just in Web3, like across the board. I think this is um, something that we need to educate ourselves on, like everybody. Like I've told my mom, everybody, you know, uh, you got to watch out for some <laughs> of these things. I think on the, the actual uh, tech side, one of the problems that I've seen, there's two sides to it. One of the problems I see it is um, you've got to get your code audited. Hmm. And you need a good auditor. And a lot of people don't want to pay the price because I won't say their name, but <laughs> a very, very high end auditor I got a quote from, and it was 40,000 US dollars a month hmm. as a retainer, or it was $40,000 per contract, something like something along those lines, right? Okay. It was an astronomical hmm. amount of money. Um, and also there's no guarantees. So if you do get hacked, they're right. off the hook. So the two sides are, okay, hey, I'm trying to get the thing to market very quickly. And I have investors or, you know, I'm trying to get investors. So I'm trying to have an MVP out. And um, mm. the other side is you have these uh, auditors that are like, well, everybody's got so much of this VC money. We'll just, you know, we'll, we'll get as much of this as possible and we don't bear any liability. Right. So I think this is one of the ways that we need to uh, we need to adjust the relationship between auditors and builders. Um, it would be great to have it internally, but honestly, it makes a lot of sense to have a third party come in um, instead of just having an internal security person. Mm -hmm. Having a third party, an objective outside set of eyes, look at um, what you're doing is so important and, and across the board, creative mm. endeavor, endeavors. If you're writing something, if you're, if you're publishing something, you want to have a third party look at this. So I think having good auditors that aren't going to charge you an arm and a leg that maybe do take some of the liability if they do uh, char charge an arm and a leg. Um, I think that's one of the easiest, lowest hanging fruits that we can to resolve some of the, t the tech issues. Um, I, it's difficult when you get beyond this, because if, you know, some people are like, well, we just put in a emergency stop feature or put in some of these like uh, uh, admin features onto the smart contract. Well, then it's not really web three anymore. You know what I mean? And then mm -hmm. you can have the hack from inside. And there's been a lot of that as well. And so right. you get these disgruntled right. de developers and things like that. And again, more reason to have a third party look at these things. Mm. Um, so it's, a lot of it's really just human error or or human uh, negligence or you know uh, ego or whatever that that comes into a lot of the security vulnerabilities, which is unfortunate. Um, right, right. Well, yeah. do you do you believe insurance has a play in that? So, for example, I went through a a process in in one of my jobs where we looked at um, acquiring insurance for a certain amount of um, assets in cold and hot wallets. And part mm. of that process, in order for you to acquire that license, they had to do their due diligence. At that point, in a, in a way, it was like an audit. Now, how it was done, this was some years back. A lot of it was, um, uh, you know, done by humans. Uh, they call it the four eyes approach. You always got two people, you know, different passwords sharing, getting into a vault and all these different things, which kind of still happens. Even though if you have got, you know, you, you put your keys on different or areas around the the earth, you know, you still have to find a way to audit that all that stuff, right? And it's not only how assets are moved in and out of uh, to hot to cold, but it, it's also the code itself, right? Mm -hmm. And basically, there's no back doors, and you know, that's why I always wondered when I heard um, when I was reading all these things about FTX. So after FTX, they locked them at, down, but money was still being moved left and right because certain people had access, and you just didn't know who yeah. had access, right? So, yeah, I guess to the point, do you think insurance could play like insurance that requires an audit to happen? Maybe the cost might come down a little bit. I don't know. Yes. Um, and I know that there were some uh, there are some insurance Web3 specific insurance protocols. I think Morpheus was one of them. This is back in the day. I, I don't know if they're still around. There's a lot right. of these projects that aren't around anymore because <laughs> right. they weren't ever able to find the right product market fit. But hmm. maybe this next cycle. Um, I do think insurance would be really, really helpful. Um, how it goes about getting implemented, I would be curious because yeah. um, it's a very sort of dynamic, ongoing situation and there's so many variables to account for. But insurance isn't a new thing. <laughs> 
Right. Right. So it's just like it, it's not going to be a whole lot more complicated than where insurance um, is implemented elsewhere. Yeah. So I think if ideally what you would get is a company that has done insurance or a group of people that were part of other insurance companies before. Hmm. And you get a couple of web hardware store, the hardware side of it. And I think that could be potentially really successful. That would bring the cost down. It would still cost, though. Sure, um, and sure. people would have to opt into it. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's where some of the regulatory um, uh, uh, benefits would come in. It's just like, hey, if you want to get this license for X, Y, and Z, you have mm -hmm. to have insurance. You have to be able to protect your end users here. Um, so, you know, it's like FDIC or, or, or whatever have you. Like you getting some, I know, I know people, as soon as they are like, oh, it's <laughs> like a government control body or whatever, um, it, they get turned off immediately. But I, I think, you know, for sake of example, I think something like that could be um, very ben beneficial, especially in DeFi, especially in these spaces where you're handling a lot of money. Yeah, you're handling yeah. a lot of people's like livelihoods at, at some point, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean, or their your their their kids' college tuition or, <laughs> or something. Hmm. Um, so yeah. Well, let let us go back and, and and maybe we'll we'll kind of uh, finalize everything in, around this topic. So we talked about security. We talk uh, we talked about auditing. We talked about insurance. We talked about the matrix and the government. Do you believe that there could be a DAO? You know, you know, whether it be one or two, or basically you can call them, they, they become the, the, the oracles or basically, you know, the, 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 the overseers of what happens in these environments, not just for a country, but, you know, obviously within, you know, uh, like, hey, let's say everything that has to do with code, a, a DAO that kind of controls that. And I know DAO's had a lot of scrutinies uh, recently because, you know, money was being mismanaged, so on and so forth. But yeah, what's, what's your take on that? I think DAOs are amazing. Um, I think that there is the opportunity for um, a form of a DAO to have um, some, some governance control that would be beneficial. Uh, but to your point, there are some issues with DAOs, not just the mismanagement of money. I think that from what I've seen, there's a critical mass. And once you get over to a, over a certain threshold, you lose the community and people stop um, engaging, right? So there's right. only a small percentage of people that are actually engaging. Um, I think that uh, at certain sizes, DAOs are fantastic. So maybe you have uh, multifaceted, like a DAO made up of other DAOs or something like that. And and it turns into this like sort of multi-layered government system that trickles down to the, to the, to the lowest end users. And maybe you, I'm like, oh, I trust it. You're similar to voting. Like I trust this person for my DAO district and that person, you know, is able to cast a vote here or something along those lines. And, and we vote on it with our, um, you know, with our wallet or, or the, the DAO token or something like that. Um, I don't, uh, I, we would need to have some, uh, some clear guidelines around that because I've, I've seen a lot of these communities, they do so well for six months or, or whatever it is, or they do so well until they reach 5,000 people. And then mm -hmm. a single person over that, it all, it all starts to fall apart or people get bored. I feel like attention span in Web3 is also, you know, it's narrower and narrower, um, but I, I, I do think I, I really do believe that that DAOs are uh, or the next generation of DAOs are the future of governments, governance, not just within Web3, but like beyond that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, imagine you're a politician because there's so many politicians that like lie. It's just like, oh, lie politician. Oh, of course, uh, that are like, oh, I'm going to if I get elected this amount of money is allocated towards education. They get elected. They're like, well, that's what I said before. And things are more difficult now. <laughs> but imagine having those things written into a smart contract. So yeah. as soon as they are elected, you know, it's it's fed into an Oracle. And then the Oracle provides, uh, you know, the smart mm. contract, the information like, hey, this this person won. And then that, that money is uh, automatically uh, distributed. And if actions are taken on chain, I think there's a lot more accountability there. Um, you know, having things on chain is 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 really important for accountability and yeah. it can bring trust back to communities um, at large, because I think that's, you know, an issue we're dealing with right now. It's like, especially in, in places like the U S there's this political divide. People mm. don't trust each other. They don't trust what they're seeing on TV. They don't trust, and there's no accountability. So um, I do think DAOs can help 
this space fundamentally. I just think that they need to, uh, we need to be mindful of some of the limitations and, and how we could uh, effectively deal with those limitations as well. Okay. Well, hey, uh, I think we're going to wrap up the show. I want to oh, yeah. thank you, Andrew, for joining. I think we could talk on for uh, another hour about a lot of di different oh, stuff. Sure. I didn't even go through all my questions, but there was definitely a, a lot of um, uh, good stuff here. And I think the main thing, I think, for 2024, uh, change will be happening. And I guess uh, for sure, speculators will, I just, that's one of the things I've accepted. It'll always be there. And it's not particularly a bad thing. Um, they're the ones, um, when I say they, it's they, they, those, that interest actually helps them make the market, right, in, in mm -hmm. many ways. Um, so you can argue uh, a lot of scammers, a lot of hackers, but that's how we learn, right? If that yeah. didn't happen, uh, then I, I'd rather have, have it happen now rather than later, later mm -hmm. uh, and when it's when it when everyone is like involved right so i think um uh yeah we'll we'll see how it is it, any um so i guess i'll ask you one last thing in web3 in itself you know what is like uh who are the i guess the top three people you follow that you believe will really make a huge change in this space um yeah oh that's a good question um <laughs> That's a really good question. I think, I mean, Vitalik, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, I, I, I like him. Um, I've seen him talk a couple of times. He's, he's really awkward and he's never wearing flashy, flashy things. I see, a, I just, by the way he dresses and the way he carries himself and he's always yeah. like trying to bet on like the, the, get the cheapest hotel. Gavin Wood from Polkadot. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like him. Um, I mean, him, him and Vitalik are, are, you know, they're, they're long time, they're long time buddies. Right. And in terms of, uh, uh, and I'll throw an influencer in there, not a, not a builder, sure. uh, Chico crypto. Okay. Um, I like Chico. Um, I think he's, um, he's been really brutal about things for a very long time. And I like that even in, even in the bull markets, he's mm. pretty brutal. And I appreciate that. Uh, you know, there's, there's some people out there who are always just like, Oh, FOMO, FOMO, FOMO. And he's always like, Hey, be cautious. Here's a, here's a long-term project that I'm very interested in, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate honesty at that, at that level. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, and, uh, thanks for joining the show and, right. uh, yeah. happy to catch up with you again, uh, sometime in 2024. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Art. All right. Have a good day. Hey, so that concludes this episode of the Startup Voyage podcast. I would like to thank all of you for listening to this episode. And I'd really appreciate it if you leave any type of comments um, that you'd like to share because it helps to feedback on how I deliver um, these podcasts.